Hello and welcome to today's webcast. Stand out for the right reasons in the reputation economy. My name is Sarah, I'm from Redback Conferencing and I will be your facilitator for today's session. Today's webcast is all about taking control of your reputation and building reputational capital. I would like to welcome our host for today, Dr. Neryl East. She's an expert when it comes to reputation and in the media. How are you today, Neryl? I'm very well, thank you, Sarah. Hello and hello, everybody. Nice to be here. Great to have you here. Now, I really want to kick things off straight away and get into this. Sure. And I think the most simple question to start with is, how important is reputation? It's a great question, isn't it? It's what everybody wants to know. And reputation has always been important. I mean, this is nothing new, is it? We, we've always known that, you know, first impressions count mm -hmm. and word of mouth is so important yes. for our organisations and for ourselves as individuals. So nothing's really changed there. What has changed, though, in this digital age we're in, which has just made so many changes to all of our lives, is that now the rest of the world is really controlling the agenda when it comes to our reputation and they've now got all these tools that they can use to pass on word about us. So that's been the shift and savvy organisations and savvy businesses are starting to realise this but it's happening fairly slowly. So um, I feel really passionate about bringing this to the attention of, of businesses, of not-for-profit organisations and of course individuals because mm. we have personal reputation as well. So that's that's some of the areas that I'd like to, to cover when, when we speak today. Great, so we'll be talking both about organisational reputation and individual reputation? Absolutely, because you know they're both critically important. I mean, we're now in what, um, what has become known as the reputation economy. Mm. You might have actually heard this term. If you haven't heard it yet, you probably will really soon. And mm. it's interesting that there's now research, there's an organisation called the Reputation Institute and there are other organisations researching this and they're, they're finding evidence now, what we already suspected, mm. that people are more likely to form and pass on an opinion of you and your organisation based on what they've heard from others. And I use heard in the broader sense, including heard seen on social media, mm. than on what you actually do. So you could be doing the best possible job, making fantastic products, delivering great services, doing an amazing performance. Mm. But if you're not known for that and if people aren't talking about that to others, then you're really not being as effective as you need to be now mm. in building your reputation capital. So that's been the interesting shift in this digital age and the reputation economy era. But hasn't it always been important, reputation? What's the difference now? It, it totally has always been important, but you know now people can see deeply into our mm. organisations in ways that they haven't been able to do that before. So in the past, many organisations and businesses had what I like to call a decide and tell culture. Okay. So, um, you know, uh, they made decisions. This might sound familiar to many of you if you work in, in, in organisations that um, things happen behind closed doors. And then at a certain point, a conscious decision was made that now we're going to tell our stakeholders or our audience about that. And in the past, mm. we could control the channels because there were a lot fewer channels. You know, mm. maybe we put out a media release or we put out a newsletter or we sent some emails or we had meetings with people. And, you know, it was a lot more under our control. Mm. Well, now there's no control because the channels are completely open. Yep. Everybody's got access to all these, these channels. It's kind of like being on a global stage 24 mm. hours a day you know we used to talk about our 15 minutes of fame you might have heard that saying yep. well the 15 minutes now kind of goes on forever yeah because once you're out there in the public eye that that reputation is there forever so you know a lot of the times I talk to businesses or individuals and they say yeah things have changed because now we've got Facebook and Twitter yeah and I like to remind people that you know they're just tools mm. they're just the tools it's really the deeper changes that those tools have driven that we need to consider. It really is a game changer. So the whole world has changed because the power is now in the hands of the people consuming our messages and that's never really happened before. Mm. And it's interesting that as part of all this, a lot of business leaders are now saying they recognise that reputation management is critically important, but are they necessarily doing what they need to do about that? Well, probably not. Mm. And we'll talk about some of the, the steps that we can go through as organisations and as individuals as we go along mm. here. 
but yeah, the key thing is <laughs> people can see All into your time. business yeah. uh, in a way that they couldn't do before. And as we know, they're not afraid to tell the world what they think and they're yeah. doing that every second of the day on all these different channels now. So we know that people, as we can see here, have access to information about us and our organisation on a regular basis whenever they want to. Sure. So how can, as a business or an organisation, can we manage our reputation? That's an interesting question, isn't it? And, you know, the short answer to that is we can't control it. Mm. I mean, if you just have a look, I think we've got a slide here. So this is this is a model from the Reputation Institute. And I love this because it starts to put things in perspective. Mm. So can we control our reputation? Well, no, we actually can't. Because when you think about it, what is your reputation? It, it's the collective perception of what other people think about you. And so now in this digital age we're in, that's the whole world, isn't it? Mm, our market, our audience is everybody yeah. in the world potentially. Yep. So that's that collective perception. And it's highly subjective what other people think about us. Mm. We can't control that. What we can control is who we are, what our organisation really stands for, what we stand for as an individual, and then how we convey that to the rest of the world. So this model from the Reputation Institute shows the balance between the being what a company is um, or an organisation or a business, you can substitute that, what they say about themselves and then what they actually do. And if those things align, then that's going to start to influence what other people say about you. I've got a slightly quirkier model. Can I show you that one? Go for it. So this <laughs> we is, like quirky. This is kind of the serious model. I prefer the... Uh, the three-legged stool model. Oh, this is much brighter. <laughs> this is my model of reputation. This is really important because, Sarah, um, when we say the word reputation, mm. a lot of people think we're talking about marketing, PR, yes. maybe even a bit of spin doctoring. Yes. <laughs> um, and you know, that forms part of it, but it's only a part. Mm. So there are many, many other things that influence what people think about us and what they say about us. So... I liken it to a three-legged stool or a tripod if you're more of a scientific persuasion, mm. but let's stick with the stool for now. So if you can imagine the first level of the stool, and firstly, imagine your precious reputation, which might be your, your company, your organisation, or your own reputation, mm. is balanced precariously on the top of the stool. So it's okay. holding up your reputation. Yep. One leg of the stool is what you say about yourself. So this is all of your marketing, it's you know, the colour of your uniform, colour of your logo, mm. all those all those outward facing things. So that's a critical part of your reputation, but it's only one part. So a lot of people stop there and think, mm, well, that's my that's reputation. All, yeah. But that's that's only the first part. The second leg is how people actually directly experience us. Mm. So this is all of our, our customer interactions or as individuals, how we actually communicate with people. And, you know, we have a business body language. We have a personal body language. Mm. Obviously, if you're wanting to communicate effectively, what you say and your, your body movements, your gestures need to align with that or mm. you're not going to come across as being very authentic. Yep. The same is true for a business or organisation. What you say about yourself and how people actually experience you mm. must line up. Otherwise... You've already got two rickety legs of your stool mm. and your reputation is looking a bit dodgy, a bit balancing on top. But the third leg of the stool, and this is the one people often forget about, is the main way our reputation is now formed and that's what others say to others. Mm. And, you know, do you reckon in this digital age that that's got, you know, out of proportion and is larger than the other two? Mm. <laughs> well, yeah, I believe it has. Um, so we can't control that leg of the stool. What we can do is do everything in our power to build up those first two legs. So making mm. sure that what we're putting out there is a, a true reflection of who we are. It's positive. It's constant. Mm. It's deliberate. It's proactive. It's strategic. So this is, you know, really the being, doing the best, um, the best marketing, the, the most consistent messaging that we can have to portray who we are to the world. And then mm. making sure that we follow that through by our behaviour. 
it's no good having a great, you know, window dressing if we're not following that through mm. the way we behave. So we talk, uh, we look at this now and I'm just liking that a lot to um, word of mouth. So sure. there's a lot of talk lately about employee engagement, employee culture. What your employees say, would that also impact your reputation? Is that something that we really must consider now in this day and age? Absolutely. And this is another one of these game changers um, yeah. that, that I talk about in the, in the reputation economy. I mean, you know, you don't have to look very far anywhere online yeah. to see incidents where organisations have got into a bit of trouble because information's got out and yeah. a lot of the time it's got out because somebody within the organisation has put it out there. And so the power has really shifted to people within our organisation. Mm. They've got the tools and they've got the inside knowledge to, to share a whole lot of information with the outside world. Mm. Sometimes it might be information that we preferred that they didn't share. But the reality is this is the, this is the culture now, isn't mm. it? So, so building up that, that employee loyalty so that they're not likely to do that is critically important. But it goes even further than that. I mean, you know, it doesn't take a lot to have your reputation damaged by one disgruntled employee. And I see this so many times. Mm. I do a lot of work managing really difficult issues for organisations by far the majority of times, the incident is caused within the organisation itself mm. through a disgruntled employee or through a situation that wasn't managed well, it wasn't nipped in the bud, it was just allowed to fester. Yep. You know, we just kind of pretended it wasn't there or didn't manage it and then it's escalated and all of a sudden it's gone into the, into the public domain. Mm. Then it might be picked up by mainstream media and who knows where it will end up. Mm. So it's... This is really fascinating and, it, and I guess it highlights the importance of making sure that you nurture your employees. And if you work in an organisation, realising you are that organisation's number one reputation ambassador 24 mm. hours a day. All the time. And, you know, th there's research around this as well. Um, there's this thing called the Edelman Trust Barometer. Edelman, it's a global public relations firm. They do a major piece of research every year. Uh, they interview people in about 26 countries, a yep. large survey, and they ask the same question so that they can get um, trends, and it's all around trust and authenticity. Okay. And um, one of the questions they ask in this survey is, if you were to hear information about a company or an organisation, who would be the most credible source of information from that organisation? Mm. And this is really interesting. In uh, 2011, uh, that question was asked and subject matter experts, very highly credible, mm. which is probably not surprising. But about 50% of respondents said the CEO or the organisational leader, highly credible, highly credible. This is 2011. Which is what you'd expect. Absolutely. You'd hope, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, regular employees, somebody like me, mm -hmm. were, you know, a little bit credible, but, but certainly weren't up there anywhere near the organisational yep. leader. Two years later, 2013, very interesting results. Same question was asked in the same survey. Mm. Who'd be the most credible source of information? Again, subject matter experts, highly credible. Yep. So again, subject matter e experts out there, fantastic. Yep. Keep, <laughs> keep, keep up the good work. Um, but here's the interesting thing. Organisational leader, CEO, mm -hmm. you know, in 2011, about 50% of people said highly credible, had fallen. Quite a lot. So the employees? Regular employees, someone like me, down here in 2011, 2013, had come up, so we'd actually reversed the mm. trend. Isn't that interesting? And this, this is, again, highlighted in how influenced we are by our peers now. Mm. I mean, I'm sure most of us, when we book travel, when we book restaurants, accommodation, you know, we check out TripAdvisor, we look at other websites first, mm. we read reviews, before we go ahead and book. Absolutely. I mean, I booked some accommodation in New York recently yep. and then I read the reviews. Should have done it the other way around. Terrible, terrible reviews about this hotel. Like, under no circumstances, do not ever stay at this hotel. That bad. Page after page. I actually cancelled the booking and booked somewhere yeah. else. Now, if you told me five years ago that I would be that highly influenced by people I'd never even met. Random people. I would have laughed, <laughs> but we're highly influenced. So this translates into mm. businesses and organisations. Our employees have, a, have an incredible amount of power in influencing what other people think about our organisation 
by their behaviour, yeah. not just when they're at work. Not Anywhere. Just well, you never know who, who knows who, especially now, yeah. do you? Absolutely. But organisations, I'm finding, aren't recognising this fact mm. and they're not putting resources into skilling up their employees, mm. helping their employees understand the critical role they play in being reputation ambassadors. Mm. And they're going to pay the price for that, unfortunately, because a lot of the times these reputational issues come from within yeah. because employees get frustrated and then they're on social media and then who knows where it ends. And I think a lot of this has to do with the internet and social media, which we are talking yes. about before we yes. started today, and it's had a huge impact in the way that organisations operate. As an expert, what changes has it also brought about? I could imagine, you know, a long time ago before social media, or what Wasn't seems that like long, a long it? time ago, <laughs> um, it seems like it's always been here, to be honest. In terms of crisis and any sort of reputational crisis, how was it dealt with then? What has sort of impact has social media made? Yeah, well, you know, managing a crisis has never been straightforward or easy. Mm. It certainly was a whole lot more straightforward before social media mm. because, again, organisations, to an extent, could control some of the channels. Some of it. The mainstream media they certainly couldn't control, mm. but, they, but they could control their response. Yes. So they could, you know, get away to an extent with saying a minimal amount mm. or saying certain things... Whereas now, because, you know, the truth is out there, people can see into what we're doing, everything is exposed. Mm. Um, and also just the speed of things. Um, for example, um, in 2006, I worked for uh, Wollongong City Council, large local government authority in New South Wales. And um, <laughs> one day we were working there and the organisation was raided by ICAC, the Independent Commission Against Corruption. And it was very dramatic. ICAC arrived, came in, they had ca a camera crew with camera rolling and they went in and, and uh, started this investigation. They evacuated part of the building and it was quite a dramatic mm. scene. And um, I was the communications manager at the time and uh, I was getting media calls. The media were asking me, what's going on at your council building? Part of the building's been evacuated. Is it a terrorist attack? Yeah. What's going on? And I was under orders from the Independent Commission Against Corruption not to release any information. Mm. Not that I knew a lot, mm. but whatever information I had, I was under strict instructions not to release anything. So for a certain time, even though all this was going on, it was cloak and dagger stuff. Yeah. And, and we didn't release information to the media. But that was pre-social media, mm. only 2006, but pre-social media. I like to think, can you imagine if that had happened now? now? You would have had employees hanging over the stairwells yeah. with their phones recording as the, as the raid yeah. happened. They would have been posting, tweeting, sharing, mm. liking before I even knew what was going on. Yeah. So the speed of the way information travels, I think that's been the biggest shift. Mm. You know, and it's out there and often we, we learn about it when it appears on social yes. media rather than being able to manage the message. And it's probably just going to get faster. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So my, my my best advice to any organisation about crisis management is always don't have one. Yeah. <laughs> so it's about putting steps in place um, to manage that. And, and part of this building reputation capital, is that's a huge element of mm. that. So when it comes to building this reputation capital, is it something that needs to start from the top? Or as employees, what can we do to assist our organisation to make sure that if a crisis does happen or something like that, we can bounce back? Sure. Well, I think it's both. I think mm. it needs to be driven from the top, absolutely. Mm. But make no mistake, regular employees or employees at any level mm. have a critical role to play. So it's no good... Uh, the leadership of an organisation saying one thing yeah. and the employees doing something else because the employees have, have the power at their fingertips yeah. to spread conflicting messages. So it's got to be commitment at the top followed through with genuine action throughout the organisation. Mm. So there are some steps that we can go through about you know how to build reputation capital. Do you want to start going through those? Let's have a look at that yeah. now. So I like to use the acronym EARS. So building reputation capital, ears. all about okay. having big EARS, E-A-R-S. That's memorable. It is, <laughs> it is, it is. And, you know, remember, <laughs> there are some good reasons why we need to be building mm. reputation capital. I mean, it's those companies, I mean, there's research now that's shown there's a link between reputation and ROI. So, so you know, the companies with the strongest reputations having greater market mm. share attracting the best employees, being able to charge higher prices yeah. for not-for-profits 
all about attracting more government grants, yeah. more sponsorships. And also, if there are any problems, organisations with the strongest reputation have a much better chance of managing those issues and not being decimated yeah. by problems, being able to bounce back. Mm. And then at an individual level, obviously people with the best reputations are going to get the best opportunities. You know, the promotions, the mm. great jobs, being offered the great projects, but also people are going to be drawn to you. Mm. You'll have people wanting to be on your team. We want to do business with people yep. who we've heard about who have strong reputations. Mm. So that's even more important now. So does this EARS model also apply to us as individuals? Absolutely okay, it does. Great. Yeah, yeah. So the first part of the EARS model is E for essence. This is the essence of your, your brand, the essence of who you stand for. Mm. And um, I'm sure you've experienced this, Sarah, too, in the, the, the many people you mm. talk to, that sometimes when we think about, about branding and reputation, people think it's, it's something that you can just stick on the outside. Yeah. And you know this is this this is very deep within the organisation mm. that this is about being really really clear on what you stand for, and that goes beyond just what's in the mission statement. Yeah, what is it that we're actually here to do? And as an individual, what is it that I'm actually here to do? Not just your job title. Mm. What does that mean? You know, I am the such and such manager, which means. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> You need to break that down. And um, there's a great analogy I like to use about the US space program in the 1960s, mm -hmm. that they had this absolutely crystal clear purpose or essence that was to put a man on the moon. And I say man, because it was at the time, yeah. I put a man on the moon. And it didn't matter if you were the chief space engineer or the cleaner, mm. you came to work every day with that to absolute that. mission. And that was the essence of, of that organization. And I like to say to, to businesses, to teams and to people, what's your man on the moon? Mm. What is it that you're here to do? So I think, you know, this goes back to being really clear about that because... Yeah. It's, sorry, is that something that we should be communicating as businesses? And, I, you know, you go to a lot of organisations' websites and they have mission statements, vision statements, which are quite long and very wordy at times. Is it worthwhile just putting a one, you know, five words or something on there that really does communicate your essence? Yep, definitely. I think it starts with being inside the organisation yeah. and knowing yep. what you're there to do. But then, yes, exactly, finding a way to be known for that. Mm finding a way to be known for that. And that may not necessarily be the same as what's on your website or what, yeah. what's in your mission statement. Sometimes they're quite hollow words. I'm talking about the authentic, you know, mm. the real purpose for why we're here, the man on the moon. Yeah. So it starts with that. So it doesn't matter if, you, if it's a large organisation, a small business or a person. Mm. Um, I like to go through this exercise of, of getting people to reflect on what their purpose is. I did this actually last week with a group of women leaders and mm -hmm. it was amazing. These were some heavy hitters, amazing mm. women. Some of them had never actually considered this. Mm. They knew their job title and they knew the stuff that they did, the outputs, but they hadn't ever really thought about the outcome. Mm. What are they trying to do? Exactly. And, and this was you know, almost a higher purpose. Some of them were almost embarrassed to yeah. think about their higher purpose, but I'm thinking, well, isn't that why you're here? Mm. <laughs> if that's not why you're here, then why are you doing what yeah. you do? Once you start to connect with that, then that then helps to drive the mm. messages you put to the outside world and it starts to become a lot more authentic than just the colour of the logo or the window dressing that you yeah. put on the outside. It's much more. So that's our essence. So start with that. The A stands for awareness. Now, this creature is, um, it's a South American fish called an anablep. Okay, and, um, got it. I, I like did to look at it for a little while. <laughs> it's, it's weird, isn't it? It's actually got four eyes. Now, I didn't come up with this analogy. I, I heard somebody else use this example in a different way. And mm. I thought, you know, I'm going to take this and apply this to reputation because it works really well. So an anablep has four eyes. And so two of the eyes are above the water checking out for predators. And then the other two are below the water are looking out for food, which is kind of cool when yeah. you think about it. This is how we need to be when it comes to our reputation. Mm. We need a set of eyes scanning the horizon to be really, really aware of what's being said about us, mm. whether we're a business or whether we're a person. You need to know what is being said about you by others. You can't necessarily control it and you may not necessarily be able to discover everything. Mm. Some of those conversations won't be in an open forum. But you need to have a very clear idea. Otherwise, you're just blundering along 
in the dark and mm. not really knowing what it is you're dealing with. And then it's a matter of um, putting into practice what I call constant weeding. When you, when you identify an issue that might impact your reputation, it's doing something about it straight away. And I guess that applies, um, I know in the past when social media really did become big, um, people, you know, they get negative posts or something on their social media pages as an organisation yes. and how not responding or deleting is possibly the worst thing you can do, isn't it? That's right, that's right. It does become difficult if you're a large organisation yeah. and there's a barrage, yeah. but you know we can't ignore this because this is our currency, it's the yeah. reputation economy, so we've got to find a way to resource that mm. to respond appropriately. So that's the external, the eyes above the water, but we've also got the other set of eyes and this is the eyes within mm. and this is just as important. So for an organisation, it's about really knowing what's going on and you know again the number of crises and issues that I've been called in mm. to help resolve where the problems actually been caused from within the organization yeah. is amazing you know we are so good at shooting ourselves in the foot mm. I always say never underestimate people's potential to do dumb things mm. and they will but then organizations try to cover it up or they mm. they pretend it hasn't happened and don't do anything about it yeah and then as, as individuals, again, it's also being really aware inwardly of, mm. of, of you know, how are we travelling? How are we performing? Are we really delivering on our promises? How are people actually experiencing us? Mm. If there are areas where we need to develop, then being prepared to do the work and develop those. These are the things that are going to help build reputation mm. capital. So again, far beyond just the pretty stuff on the outside. Mm. You know, it's an inside job. It starts, it starts from within. I take that a step further. This is a, a, another model that I like to, to work with. And you can see um, the bottom left, you're courting disaster. This is you're not aware of what's going on with your reputation and mm. you're not taking any action. Yeah. So you're courting disaster. It's a matter of time before some major reputational problem is going to come your way. Or you could be very aware, but you're not actually taking any action. Yeah. I call that burying your head in the sand. So you know there's a problem, but you've, you're kind of going Forget. la 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 <laughs> and let's just ignore it. And I see plenty of that in yeah. businesses and organisations. Or you could be very active. You're running around and you're doing all this social media and you're putting stuff out there, but you haven't done any work to actually gauge what your reputation is mm. like to start with. And I call that just missing the landmines. Mm. You're running around and you might be missing disaster, but only by a little bit, mm. sooner or later, something's going to go wrong yeah or you could be really aware and really active and strategic and that's truly building reputation capital mm. so it's a matter of having both of those elements so awareness is important needs to be um, coupled with action as well mm. hope that's making sense to everybody so when it comes to becoming aware is it just you know within your organization just taking a step back sometimes and just focusing on what's happening inside as opposed to having this whole external view. Is that the, is that the only thing you can do? It, yeah, definitely it has to be systematic mm, and yeah. strategic. So difficult as this will be because we're all busy doing our day yeah. jobs, but you know, this is the reputation economy and it's yeah. critical. The companies that are and the organisations that are succeeding at this and have the strongest reputations, and this is research from the Reputation Institute, have systematic ways of building reputation. Mm. So they actually have allocated time and resources to exactly this stuff, yeah. to making sure that they're keeping on top of what are people saying about yeah. us and what's going on inside. They have a process, whether it's a weekly meeting or some other mechanism, where they're talking about what are the potential issues that could crop up Absolutely. in our business or our organisation. Rather than waiting till it's exploded into some major yeah. problem, they're doing this proactively, they're weeding the garden constantly mm. and they're reaping the rewards because their reputation's growing positively, standing out for the right reasons, as I say, not the wrong ones, because they're keeping on top of these okay. things. So I think we're up to the R of our oh, ears, so we'll move on. And this is relationships, yeah. I mean, the world now runs on relationships. Mm. You know, and obviously we're, we're heavily networked. I don't yeah. know about you, Sarah. You're probably in lots mm. of different networks. Yep. We're networked, you know, to within an inch of our life. But it goes further than that. We're actually now in an entire ecosystem of influence. Mm. So, you know, we're interacting and interwoven in our relationships with so many people around the world because we can connect with them through yeah. social media. And anything that happens in one part of the ecosystem will ripple through and have an impact elsewhere in the ecosystem. So another key strategy for building your reputation is to really focus in 
mm. on your relationships to make sure that you're, you're, you're really thinking about who are the people in my ecosystem? Mm. Who are the ones that I need to nurture the relationships with? And just on that, we just have a question that's come through from Nat. Excellent. Um, so Nat asks, in terms of building reputation, how much of a role can LinkedIn play in this? Yeah, fantastic question. I mean, yeah, LinkedIn is one of the, the, mm. the many tools available to us. LinkedIn is fantastic in, in, the, in the business and corporate world. Yeah. I mean, it's like the corporate Facebook, yeah. isn't it? Uh, because now we can see who's who in the zoo. You mm. can easily get on there and see who are the key people that you might want to connect with. Yeah. Um, and you've got that great uh, mechanism on LinkedIn. I don't know what it's called, but you can look at someone's profile and you can see how they're connected with you. It's like a tree almost. Yeah, yeah. so that you know, they might be one removed from you, but there's mm. somebody, a mutual contact you've got. And so you can contact that person yep. and ask for an introduction. I always say to people though, Let's not, you know, face to face is still the preferred yes. method of communication. I always advise people, if possible, yep. conversations where you can see people's eyeballs. So, so LinkedIn is a great um, introduction opportunity, but follow up in person. Mm. Make make those approaches in in person and start to build rapport and relationships. And I guess now there's a lot of people and organisations publishing posts and um, insights, if you like, yes, onto Facebook. Definitely. So can that play into, you know, you're wanting to establish yourself or your organisation as a thought leader within the industry? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. So yeah, this is about being great at what you do mm. and then being known for being great. Yeah. So at an individual level, and, and at a corporate level, one of the most effective ways you can do that is to take steps to, to establish yourself mm. as a thought leader. And that's really about exactly what we've said, mm. being clear on who you are and what you stand for, and then communicating that to the world through the content you publish, yeah. through the way you behave with people, the way you interact, what you share. I mean, you see people sharing all kinds of random stuff mm. on LinkedIn. That, but yeah, it doesn't really seem LinkedIn appropriate sometimes. Yeah. So, so I'd really suggest that that if you know if that's what you're wanting to do, sharing content on LinkedIn, and I, you know, I, I highly recommend that as a way of building mm. your building your voice. Make sure it's consistent with what you stand for. So really think about the essence mm. and ch choose content, vet it, don't just share any old thing. Yeah. I mean, I won't share anything that's a blatant sales pitch. You know, you start to read it and then three paragraphs in, there's the sales oh. pitch. <laughs> don't share that. But really useful, valuable content that's linked directly to your, to your essence, mm. absolutely, that can start to build up a really strong profile. And yeah, starting to build up as a thought leader is a great way to build reputation capital. Great, great question. Yeah. So that was the R of our relationship, R of our ears, relationships. So you know, don't neglect the good old fashioned way of connecting with yeah. people. Sometimes we get caught up in this dizzying array of technology mm. and it's fantastic that it's there, but sometimes the old school things are, are great as well. Yeah. Sometimes I recommend, you know, to CEOs of organisations, just have a conversation with that person mm. and they look at me like I'm a genius. <laughs> conversation. Who would have thought? Light bulb moment. <laughs> Absolutely. So, you know, don't, don't, this is all about people connecting yeah, with people. Exactly. We're now fortunate enough. We've got great tools to do that, but we've still got to connect. So connect mm. in an authentic way. And that starts with being clear, building these relationships. Mm. Shall we move on to S? S. I know time's getting away here. And this is our systems. So mm. this is what I was talking about, that the, the, the most reputable companies in the world, most reputable organisations have systems for doing this. They have strategies. They have great, they have a reputation strategy. Mm. They have a communication strategy. If they're going to deal with media, social media, they have a strategy for doing that. Yep. It's not just done randomly yeah. or in an ad hoc or reactive manner. And a lot of the time I see many businesses just do that randomly. It's have a good idea. Let's put it out there. Yeah. So I really encourage you to think about doing this in a strategic way. And similarly with individuals, if you want to build your profile, build your reputation, sit down and think about some objectives mm. and set yourself some goals and some time frames. And it might be, I'm going to share three different types of content on yeah. LinkedIn every week, but it's going to be content that's linked to my essence. Mm. It might be becoming aware that, hang on, I need to build my skills as a communicator or build my skills in networking. So doing something about that, mm. going to networking events and, and practicing or getting some coaching and mentoring or doing a course or a webinar, Putting whatever. In place. Yeah. So this is part of this internal awareness mm. and then your systems are actually putting it into action. So reputation doesn't happen by accident. It's an inside job 
and it's built in steps. That's why I like the Russian dolls. It all having yeah. the steps that all fit together. Works Hopefully well. that makes sense to everybody. Yes. Um, so now that we've gone through ears, um, hope hope everyone is familiar with that now. What are the risks of not paying attention to your reputation, whether you are an organisation or an individual? What, what's the worst that could happen? Yeah, well, and I, I'm a little bit scared to ask that question. Exactly. <laughs> we don't have to look very far, do we, to yeah. see some of the disasters that can happen if we don't pay attention to our reputation. Um, I love this analogy when I was in New York recently. This is the Apple store that's set up in Grand Central Station in New yep. York. So this beautiful historic building, mm. gorgeous lighting. And they've set up an Apple store and it's not a store with walls around it. They've actually just put the store within the building. It's mm. really cool. And it's this fantastic kind of morphing of old and new, oh, cutting mm. edge te technology with the Apple store and this grand, beautiful old mm. building. That's what we've got to be like. We've got to be agile and we've got to be able to take opportunities and I guess communicate these kind of old style values of relationship building mm. with the latest technology. Yep. And if we can do that, we are going to be fantastic reputation builders mm. for our organisation. If not, we risk becoming dinosaurs mm. and just being extinct um, or having some sort of major reputational disaster. Yeah. So you don't have to look very far online to see examples of organisations who have got this wrong who haven't managed their relationships well, who aren't clear on what they stand for, who haven't responded, don't have systems in place, and they've ended up in social media storms, mm. that's going to have long-term impacts on their reputation. Can you bounce back from that? That depends. Yeah. Depends on your reputation to start with and how well you manage it, but it's not easy. Far better to have built an amazing reputation in the first place and manage things as they crop up. Mm. So I'm sure nobody wants to be extinct like a dinosaur as a business, as a not-for-profit, and as an individual. You don't want your career to be mm. extinct. So the best way to guard against that is, is to consciously, strategically, deliberately go through these steps that I've outlined and build reputation capital. So it's about prevention, isn't it? Absolutely. Cure, like most things. Absolutely, <laughs> it is. It is. I mean, I used to market myself as the crunch time communicator because I worked <laughs> in the media for a long time. I was the go-to girl when things went horribly wrong. People would call me and it was a bit like calling the paramedics when yeah. things were serious. And I got to thinking, you know, this is crazy. Mm. I want to work at the other end and, and show businesses and people how to, how to prevent this yeah. because 90% of the time it was totally preventable. Yeah. They'd made a mistake or something had happened and they hadn't responded well or they had poor relationships with people already. So, of course, when people got angry, if they already had bad relationships, it went from bad to worse. Yeah. By putting some of these steps back in the beginning, it, it was preventative. Mm. It, you've got to be prepared to do the work. But my question is, do you want a great reputation? And I'm sure you do. Then this really needs to be a focus and something that you build in to, to every day, building into organisational decision making and also in the way you operate mm. as an individual. Excellent. Well, that brings us close to the end. Um, closing comments from yourself? Closing comments don't underestimate the power of reputation. Mm. You know, I, I work with businesses every day who, who haven't heeded this advice, mm. who've paid the price. Um, and then take a long time to get back on top if they ever do. Yeah. So far, far better to, to take the steps, really be aware of what's going on and take action and put strategies in place. And, and don't neglect traditional media is still there. Mm. Make that work in with your social media, but don't just focus on the window dressing. Yes. Know who you are, but be great and then be known for being great. Hopefully that's been helpful today. I think that's been very, very helpful. Thank you so much, Neryl. It's been great chatting with you. And thank you everyone online for watching. We hope that you've taken some great insights out of today for not only yourself, but possibly even your organisation. So thank you once again for joining. We hope to see you at future Business Skills events and enjoy the rest of your day. Bye for now. Thank you. Bye.